I often wonder about the nature of reality, about our relationship to the creative force that forged the particles of our stars and intertwined them with the molecules of our bodies. Who are we? And where are we actually sitting within the architecture of our universe? Are we alone? Or is the answer simply stranger than we can think? My name is Jeremy Corbell. I seek to weaponize your curiosity. And if you're ready to suspend your own prejudice, welcome to the world of extraordinary beliefs. This week we've heard the contention of UFO researchers that there is a secret government within our government. Well, there are several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. Not to burst your bubble, but the Earth is not the center of the universe. At least not anymore. You are not the star of your own movie. Humans are not the top of the food chain. And fate is a fantasy. But I can't prove any of this, even if I, even wanted, if to. I wanted to. There is an indefinable, mysterious power that pervades everything. I feel it, though I do not see it. It is this unseen power which makes itself felt. There is an indefinable, mysterious power that pervades everything. I feel it, though I do not see it. It is this unseen power which makes itself felt. There is... Reality simply isn't what it used to be. Things are not what they see. Everything around us is a mental construct. We create, we create our own reality. reality. Breaking that down is hard to do. And once it's done, there ain't no coming back. What happens to people when their fundamental beliefs, the bedrock of their understanding, explodes into a million pieces? When something comes careening from out of the blue, and it messes with everything we know. How do we react? How do we react? How do we react?
there is an indefinable mysterious power that pervades everything. Beliefs are mercurial things. They direct our lives and choices, moment by moment. They're stowaways to the imagination emporium. Harnessed to hunches, polished with proof. They're like clothing we can't afford. They elevate us, yet they're not ours to keep. We discard them when they no longer serve our needs, or we find out that they weren't real at all. This story is extraordinary, especially if it's true. And it all started in the desert, just north of Las Vegas. secret of spots on the planet. It's located on the northeast edge of the Nevada test site and is said to be where numerous top secret weapon systems have been tested over the years. According to some UFO researchers, it's also where the government is test flying alien spacecraft. It sounds pretty far out, but some Las Vegas residents report having seen these flying saucers. A local scientist who says he worked at Groom Lake and saw the saucers joins us in tonight's interview. He has asked that his identity be shielded. Sir, how do we know you are who you say you are and that you actually have knowledge about what's going on at Groom Lake? Well, I guess there's no way you could really know. Uh, uh, there's really no way I can prove it without revealing my identity and getting myself into more trouble than I have already. Exactly what's going on up there? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying disks, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin and they're being test flown and uh, uh, basically just analyzed. You say there's nine saucers. How, how are those tests going? Uh, as far as what? As far as whether they're successful and, and, and that sort of thing. Oh, well, some of them are 100% are intact and operate perfectly. Uh, the other ones are being taken apart. Uh, I was involved mainly in, in propulsion and the power source. Where, where did we get these saucers? Uh, how did they come into the hands of the government? I haven't the slightest idea, and uh, you have to understand the information is very compartmentalized, and uh, I was only allowed information that pertained particularly to what I was involved in. But I mean, couldn't, couldn't our government have made them as opposed to getting them from some alien beings? Totally impossible. Uh, the propulsion system is an, uh, a gravity propulsion system. The power source is an antimatter reactor. Uh, this technology does not exist at all. In fact, one of the reasons that I'm coming forward with this information, it's uh, not only a crime against the American people, it's a crime against the scientific community, which I've been part of for some time, who are actively trying to duplicate these systems, yet they are in existence now and basically in the hands of the government. What would happen to you if the government learned that you were giving us this information? Anything could happen. I don't know. It's, uh, I haven't the slightest idea. Well, you said uh, you were referred to getting into trouble. Have you had some repercussions already? Yeah, I've been threatened with uh, uh, being charged with espionage. Uh, I've had my life threatened by them, my wife's life threatened by them. And uh, uh, I, I mean, I don't know where else you can go from there. Well, we want to thank you for joining us. Pretty interesting stuff you've got to say. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Well, more news in just a moment. Now, first we go to Dan Rather in Beijing for a look ahead at the CBS Evening News. CBS Evening News from China. We'll have extensive coverage of PKL coverage. The live interview with the shadowy dentist drew international attention. Portions were broadcast by radio in six European countries and in a nationally televised TV special in Japan. Despite numerous inquiries and feelers, Dennis has remained anonymous until now. His real name is Robert Lazar. He says he was hired to work at an area called S-4, which is a few miles south of Groom Lake. At S-4, he says, are flying saucers, antimatter reactors, and other working examples of technology that is seemingly beyond human capabilities. 
George Knapp, Eyewitness News 8. Good evening, everyone. You're in the right place at the right time, blasting out of the Mojave Desert like a Scirocco, blazing across the land into your town, into your home, slamming into your radio like a supercharged nanoparticle of unobtainium. Greetings to all of you from the boldest, bawdiest, most outrageous city in the world, planetary capital of sun, fun, sin, sex, and secrets, my not-so-humble hometown, Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people, myself included, who would like to focus on big picture stuff. Who are these visitors? Why are they here? What is the nature of reality? What is their interest in us? Where do they come from? Now, those are the questions that people have been asking about the UFO mystery since the beginning. We're no closer to answering any of them, but Bob got pretty close. Bob got to read these briefing documents that provided those kind of answers. The thing is, when we were covering his story, so much of the effort was in proving that he really was the person he said he was. Is it true, is it plausible, that really that was the focus uh, more than the really important stuff? you have to cover the story of Bob Lazar. And the only way to do that is to talk to Bob. And I don't know if it'll talk to you or not, but you need to try. It's all gonna be circumstance for you, is the moment that you approach him, the mood that he's in, what else is going on in his life at the time. You might hit the jackpot and get him at exactly the right time and the, the universe is aligned and he's willing to talk about it. But you'd have to be awfully lucky. Uh, because in general, Bob doesn't like to talk about it. I think he's very happy in his life. He's happy to have left the UFO stuff behind. He misses his friends. He misses John Lear. He misses Gene Huff, maybe even me to some extent. Uh, but he doesn't miss the UFO topic. And he doesn't miss talking about it because ultimately it's disturbing. These are disturbing issues. They go to the heart of who we are as people, as human beings. The nature of reality itself is this a computer simulation? Are we all the product of an alien video game or some multi-dimensional movie, drive-in movie theater production or something? Big questions, disturbing answers, and Bob has never been comfortable in talking about it. Never. He reacted by going into a cocoon in a lot of ways. He didn't like it. He doesn't like the attention and it totally screwed up his life. It's not surprising that even years later, he still is uncomfortable in discussing these things. It's a very disturbing view of reality. Being a young person's guide to you, but so wow, this looks old, man. My name's Bob Lazar. I'm known for working at a classified base known as S4 out in the Nevada desert near Area 51. And there we reverse engineered alien spacecraft. And it's changed my life a lot. You know, it's probably changed every aspect of it. Positive or negative? Well, for the most part, negative. I mean, I'd, it's really difficult to find positive aspects of that. I mean, I'm sure there are some here and there, but most of them were, were negative. Do you, would, you, would you take it all back and just be Bob the Jet Car Guy and, and never have done this if you can, or are you glad you had the experience? Um, yeah, that's it's hard to say. I don't know. I, I think I'd lean towards not, at this point in my life, I'd probably lean towards not saying anything. You know, what would be your message to a young person now about looking at your story and thinking about the world? What would you say to them? Just pay attention. Just pay attention. I can't see, 
I can't really say much else. The world's a lot different now. The way information is disseminated and the way the way things are passed around, it's distorted even faster and more now than it used to be. So they've got a rough road ahead if you're trying to cut through the bullshit. What do you want them to know? Hmm. That in the late 1980s, the U.S. government had recovered alien spacecraft, several of them, and the technology in the Nevada desert that they were keeping quiet and analyzing. That's a fact. They don't need my story, but that's, I mean, that's all my story was, was that I was just one of the people working on these craft. Well, fine, I'll just say everything instead of holding back on anything, yeah. and then you can edit it later on. And... All right. Well, <laughs> take it from the top, then. Okay. Well, go ahead. <laughs> uh, how you got involved with this program? I had sent resumes to several national labs. I got a response from a couple of them. I went in for an interview. They had a job in mind, and then they continued questioning me mainly on my interests outside of work. They seem to be really concerned about that. About things like jet cars? And... Right. What do you do in your spare time? Uh, you know, you, you say you work on little projects. I said, yeah, I have a particle accelerator in my master bedroom and, and things of that sort. And uh, some time went by and they called me back in. They said uh, there was a, a senior staff physicist that was leaving uh, this organization and they basically interviewed me for that job. I was given a lot of briefings to read on, I, I believe there were 121 different briefings and they just sat me in a room and they had a, uh, while they were going and updating my clearance to a level that they call majestic. You, go, you start reading these reports, you see some of them deal with flying saucers. What's your reaction? Well, I was, I was completely shocked. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it, but uh, I was fascinated. I was so excited. I. It's, it's, a, it's a science dream, really. Eventually, I was shown them. Uh, one close-up, one operating. They had uh, one of the reactors out of the crafts, which was an antimatter reactor. Uh, I was given a demonstration on how it worked, uh, things that it did, and uh, the physics of it. The thing they were most interested in is, is duplicating the, the reactors without using this element 115. Uh, which is, of course, impossible. They were trying to, uh, and there have been projects before that, uh, just trying to use a, a normal nuclear generator fueled with plutonium, and uh, it was really a futile attempt. Some people are sources of gravity. Their certainty and wholeness commands our attention. We are drawn to them by a natural law that requires we don't, we don't quite understand the mechanism. mechanism. But the pull is like a tide, a current you can't deny, and eventually it wears you down. Call George Knapp. Calling George Knapp, mobile. Hey, George. Hey, man. What's up, man? How you doing? All right. What's going on? This is now 30 years since you initially broke the story of Bob Lazar. So, I mean, the amount of information is overwhelming, and I just want to go over with you some of the details of the case. Sure. We're talking about UFOs, alien craft, back engineering, and there's Lazar saying he did all that, and from what I understand, it spread everywhere. Yeah, you know, we had the first interview in May of 1989 with him as Dennis. Was not his real identity, not uh, not known, not revealed to the audience. And even that, before we know who Bob Lazar was, that uh, sparked a big, uh, a great deal of interest among the public. I spent uh, the eight months between May and November uh, trying to verify Bob's background to see if we could solidify the case to see if we could find out if he was telling the truth and then to the plan was to unleash it in november which is what we did it was the highest rated news series we've ever done it was the 
highest rated news special that ever aired in Las Vegas. And then it really exploded. It went all over the world. Bootleg copies of the tapes were being sold and shown in movie theaters. You had media interest from all over the world. And I, I think a lot of it was skeptical at the beginning, which of course it would be. But in the end, every major news organization in the world beat a path to Area 51's door. And tens of thousands of people started showing up out there to see whatever it was that was flying around in the desert. They're still coming all these years later. And I know a lot of my media colleagues have had problems with that story, but they've all covered it, all of them. It put Area 51 on the map. It's now known all over the world. Even though Lazar worked at S4, Area 51 is the term that the public knows. So it was huge. It was huge then, it's huge now. The mountains appear to float on dry lake beds, like spaceships from another world. They seem to ride on a viscous material channeled through empty space by heat that rises and separates. It vitrifies everything it contacts, like a, like a green glass honey. A goddamn psychedelic liquid drowning the emptiness with imagination. With imagination. This desert is pocked and punctuated by a thousand gaping holes created in a thousand atomic blasts that define an era. What are they building in the desert north of Las Vegas? What are they hiding? What are they hiding? What the fuck are they hiding? What is your name and what's your relationship to Bob Lazar? My name is Mario Santa Cruz and I met Bob uh, actually in my neighborhood. Uh, he lived like one block over. My attraction to Bob was his jet dragster. So I saw this jet dragster sitting out in front of uh, his house in our neighborhood, which was extremely, just the jet dragster alone was rare. But in my neighborhood to see something like that was unbelievable. People were harassing Bob, threatening him, and you were with him in one of those experiences, at least one. A couple of times, actually. I actually had a weapon with me, you know, when I when we rode together because he had been shot at, you know. What was the weapon? Was it the UZ? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when... Uh... I, I don't know why I'm being so careful. I'm used to being that way when it comes to talking about Bob, being careful what I say. You know what I mean? It, so it's kind of a force of habit to kind of just walk on eggshells a little bit. He just wanted to stay alive. That's why he exposed himself. His life was, it, it was in chaos. How he pulled out of it, you know, he dug deep. It's a pretty incredible story. They shot at you, somebody shot, and maybe as a warning perhaps. It was a good warning. I had my back tire shot out on my car as I was getting on the freeway. Um, my, you saw the guy. Yeah. Is this a secret worth killing to keep? I mean, the government, would you say? Obviously. But in fact, the only reason so you're doing that it. getting this on tape is uh, insurance. Well, that's one reason. But I mean, also as, a, as an American citizen, you're you're bothered by it, that this stuff is going on and uh, with people. Yeah, I, I am, but not enough to have you know stood here and, and have it on the record. Insurance is, is the true motivation behind this. A four months old in our little apartment in Florida. And that's me holding him. Very proud mom holding him. We had a beautiful little place in Florida. Look at that. One Sunday morning, must have been about six o'clock in the morning, everyone is sleeping with this huge bang. Bob had put a jet engine in the bike. At six in the morning, he decided to take it out for a trip. What did you guys think when he said, Mom, Dad, I'm building it? scared out of my mind. I didn't know what he was going to do next. Was he going to blow up the house, blow up the world? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's out there, you know? He's out there. You know, if he proves his story, let's say, maybe it would cause problems. Maybe it would blow shit up. It, it, more than likely it would. So he's best off 
keeping things on the low down down low, really. But at the same time, he has said there are way there is a way he could prove his story. And I want him to be happy. If vindication is what he wants, fine. But that's up to him. You believe him or not. It's a fearful thing to think that there's something out there that we don't know anything about. Are they dangerous? Can they hurt us? Will they attack us? You don't want to know, so you don't believe it. You'd rather not believe. There might be other things out there, other things in the universe. There has to be. We can't be all by ourselves. We can't be. My name is Joy, and I am Bob's wife. We've been together, it'll be 17 years. What is it that you think is is most misunderstood? Um, that he really is an honest guy, you know? He doesn't make stuff up. I guess it's just so big. So yeah. the easier thing to do is to point the finger and say liar. Yeah, that's so sad. That's really sad, that they don't know real Bob. There's particular moments that define each one of us. We may not know it at the time, but we learn it later. Every action creates a cascade of reactions. Life is a web of events. Actions overlaid by consequence and woven across the fabric of time and fabric of time. Future determined by past, past defined by present, present experienced throughout the lens of personal history. But for some, it's obvious. You can put your finger on it that definable, indelible moment when everything changed. I love my job. There's a lot of craftsmanship in the stuff that I do. I really like working with my hands. It's a really unique job. I don't think there's any other job where you get to do this kind of stuff every day. We'll either get a really interesting order coming in or Bob will get bored and try to come up with a new product. And that's when it gets really fun. So there's another one that he wants to do, like recreate a grand atomic uh, chemistry set, something of that sort. And I, I think that would be really cool if he ever decides to really hone in on that. This is the Atomic Energy Lab kit. It's something from the 1950s, a toy, like a chemistry set you get for your kid. It was made by Gilbert. Chemistry is today a fascinating adventure for youth of all ages. Gilbert has made this exciting science available in safe and easy to understand form, made as completely safe as human ingenuity can devise. This actually came with radioactive material. You could really conduct atomic energy experiments in it. It was fascinating. And uh, it was billed as the most dangerous toy ever made and, and still, in some respects, is still considered that way today. But the thing is, it wasn't. It was just people's fear. So here I am and I'm watching you do your work. When people don't know you, it's so easy for them to just make shit up about you and to dehumanize you. How simple that is to do. The fact that somebody would say, you're not a scientist. I mean, all I've ever done is science related stuff my entire life. So, I don't know, I guess the point is, do I really care what 
people I don't know think. And probably to some extent I do, but I don't, I don't dwell on it. I guess it is easier to discredit someone that you have no information on because you can just say anything about them and there's nothing to refute it. I mean, I feel privileged I got to work in it. So in some respects, I shouldn't be allowed to complain. I, I've given the example of a, you know, transporting one, a small modern day portable nuclear reactor back into Victorian times and giving it to the scientists there. Well, back in that time, they didn't even know about radiation. So they'd see a machine making power, kind of like what we're doing, and marvel at it. Wow, it's producing a lot of power. There's no smokestack, there's no coal, there's no fuel. How is this thing working? And they start taking it apart. Well, they'll all die as soon as they get close to the core. People would come in to check on them, will all die, and no one knows, nothing touched them. So they're going to think it's haunted or some, there's some evil forces or something in there. But, um, I mean, who says that can't happen to us? The first time Barry showed me the reactor in operation, you know, here it is on the bench, and he said, you know, try and touch the sphere on top. And you couldn't, your hand was pushed away. Just like, you know, two light poles of a magnet. It's the exact same feeling, but you know, there was no metal involved. And that's shocking. That's really shocking because nothing does that. That's an operating, powerful force field. So just seeing something like that immediately starts that whole chain reaction in your mind going, wow, wait, if you can do this, there can be force fields on tanks. There can be things that lift off the ground. We don't need jet and rocket engines anymore. That means there's, wait, there's no use for cars. I mean, boom, the whole thing changes. The entire world, the economy, everything would go end on end just if we had an answer to how that machine worked that I was sitting there touching. The potential for us to re-understand human experience is... Right. Right. There's, I mean, there's life somewhere else. It's a big deal. It's an important part of human history that we found that out. It was awesome, but fearsome at the same time. It was being completely fucking scared all day long. It's not exactly the most fun job when you're there. You know, almost three decades later, the fear drops off and you're just left with the amazement and technology that you were exposed to. We have, you know, an artifact here from another civilization. It really changes the way a lot of people think. We're all looking for an answer. Having physical proof is an awful big deal. I think what a lot of people find really compelling about Bob, he legitimately appeared and appears sometimes just perplexed by what he saw. Have you noticed that kind of about him? Yeah, he was aware that this was weird. He was aware it was weird that they hired him. I mean, you know, he's a smart guy and he thinks outside the box. So in a lot of ways, he might have been just what exactly what they needed for a program that seemed to be stalled. but. He knew that he wasn't uh, their kind of a guy, that they could have had their pick of any scientists in the world, presumably, to work on this. So it was strange, and it was strange that they started showing him these briefing books with this incredibly sensitive information right off the bat. As soon as he gets there, they start showing him this stuff with alien bodies uh, broken down so you can see their organs and the, the history of human-alien interaction. and all kinds of things that the UFO community had suspected, but no one could prove. And he just thought it was weird that anyone would show him this stuff. He wondered what the heck was going on. I think he was thrilled. You know, part of him was really thrilled to be there and thrilled to see it, even if it turned out to be some kind of a ruse. Uh, but, uh, you know, he knew that something was not quite right about the whole thing or suspected that anyway. You were telling people since 1989 that there was some sort of hand scanner. There was like a bone scanner, and you tried to describe it. You said you think it took measurements of the bone. There are these pegs. You put your hand on it. It's a small plate with some pins on it that you could put between your fingers. There's a bright light above it. The interesting thing is when you walk into the facility, or even to leave, they have a, a hand reader. I was told that it has to do something where it measures the... The bright light measures the bones in your finger. They're unique to each person. Kind of sounds like something out of a TV show, but it, it, it's exactly the way it is. Man, I looked for that kind of thing all over the Internet, never found anything. And then all of a sudden this article comes out and it says that at 
the, the Nellis range for the, uh, they were talking about the stealth program, there was indeed this hand scanner that was used in these secret programs and they just admitted or announced it publicly and there were some photos and I just was interested and so. I never thought I'd see one of these again. <laughs> but I tried to explain this to people so many times and they either didn't believe me or say, yeah, yeah, I'm sure there is. And there it is. There it is. It's like a biometric thing for the hands, yeah? The beginnings of, yeah, I mean, it wasn't all that advanced back then, but yeah, that's it. I can't believe you found a picture of this. I really can't. This was the scanner used to get in to S4. And I tried to explain this to people so many times that there was pins in, you stuck your hand, a light above, and it supposedly measured the length of the bones in your hand that, you know, is unique in each individual. It's exactly, exactly how it was. Yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing you came up with these. It's amazing to see this again. Back then, this was the hot ticket. What does it feel like when these little things that you said become public and there's this tiny bit of vindication? It is, there's little moments of vindication, you know, little pieces here and there that, you know, little I told you so's, you know, pop up every couple of years or so. But this is a big one. Um, so a lot of people said these didn't exist and, um, you know, it was some just fanciful thing I came up with. But the, yeah, this is exactly it. Ideas are the most dangerous weapons on the planet. They creep under your skin, dormant, volatile, volatile. The explosive. They attach to our collective consciousness. And then one day, man, they bubble to the surface to assert their power. And when detonated, life is never the same again. And we immediately know we're always wrong. We're always fucking wrong. I did not believe that this should be a security matter. Some of it, sure. But just the concept that there's definite proof we even have articles from another world, another system. You just can't not tell everyone. Checking out Lazar's credentials proved to be a difficult task. He says he earned degrees in physics and electronics, but the schools we contacted say they've never heard of him. He also said he worked as a physicist at Los Alamos National Lab, where he experimented with one of the world's largest particle beam accelerators, a half mile long behemoth capable of generating 700 million volts. Los Alamos officials told us they had no records of a Robert Lazar ever working there. They were either mistaken or were lying. A 1982 phone book from the lab lists Lazar right there among the other scientists and technicians. A 1982 clipping from the Los Alamos newspaper profiled Lazar and his interest in jet cars. It too mentioned his employment at the lab as a physicist. We called Los Alamos again. An exasperated official told us he still had no records on Lazar. EG&G, which is where Lazar says he was interviewed for the job at S4, also has no records. It's as if someone has made him disappear. One thing that people say about your story and your experience is that you, that you were a puppet, a marionette, that you had no control over what was going on at that time, that you, you were taken advantage, you were compromised, and you're being used as a source of disinformation. And what evidence to support that? Right. That, and, yeah, and what's the evidence to support those claims? Is that just something to say? No, I'm just saying that's what that, that's the kind if of you thing. Have to, if you make a statement, you have to have some evidence to say where the statement came from. So you're basing it on emotion, right? And fear, and you're it, afraid that I'm right. Tell me what you've heard that makes this impossible. I'm trying to tell you exactly the way things were. Where is it? Show me the alternate reality that you believe that doesn't lock up with my actual reality. I mean, where are those other facts? Just show me what they are, these facts you grabbed together and painted a different story of my life than I did. I mean, I thought I set the record straight 30 years ago. Can we ever be made whole if we're not believed? 
if our life story is challenged by consensus. Most of us are not forced to answer for our past. We can freely navigate this moment with a reverence for what came before. But some people are placed under a microscope. Their words, their actions, scrutinized and challenged. And then they're told to quiet lies. How much can a man take before he submits to the weight and consequence of distrust? Does he fade back into the shadows that formed him? Or does he lash out to carve his words into your flesh? Lash to carve his words into your flesh. I don't know, what else can I say? What else can I say? How can I prove anything else? At the worst case scenario, you lied for a girl or you lied to get a job. What does that mean about your story? Then, then Do you what? think Los Alamos just hired me out of high school? If you don't think that's possible, then something had to happen in between. I don't understand how everybody gets so caught up in the minutia because you can debate that stuff forever. We can go back before MIT and you can start fighting whether or not and where I lived in high school. That is not going to translate into answering the questions and the things that I've brought into the public eye. That's the important stuff. It almost seems like this is an intentional distraction. You need to pay attention to the bigger picture. If you really want to research all the other stuff, fine, go ahead and do it. But you really need to pay attention to what I'm saying. Because I have better things to do than come up with this. I'm not interested in doing this. I'm not, I don't like, I don't like being in the public eye. I don't got money for doing this. And quite frankly, I could make up a better lie, but I have no motivation to lie. This hasn't, this hasn't helped me out. What does that mean for Lazar's story that we can't prove his schooling, in fact? It, it was a problem. I mean, I had, I, I wondered, can we go forward if, he, if we can't verify what was going on in his background? The central point for me was, if he worked at Los Alamos, that suggests he had to have an education somewhere. I think he said it to me a couple of times. You know, what do you think? They hired me right out of uh, high school. I, I looked at uh, people who knew him back then, Jim Taliani for one, who said that, yeah, Bob went to Caltech back then. I dropped him off. I interviewed another uh, person who also uh, knew Bob then and, and said that he would drop him off at Caltech, would pick him up from the library, that if he wasn't going to school there, he sure was making a good show of it back then. <laughs> Would it prove his story about working on flying saucers if he could show he had degrees from Caltech and MIT? No, of course not. It would not prove that he worked on flying saucers. It would just prove that he went to school. The people who despise him and who doubt the story the most, the debunkers, would find something else to bitch about. Bob got into some trouble after he became a worldwide UFO celebrity. He did a typical Bob sort of a thing and got mixed up with some hookers. He was helping them set up a little mini brothel uh, in a neighborhood. And when he told me about it, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm, my professional life is flashing before my eyes here. The most high profile witness and the biggest story about, I've ever done is, is now telling me he's involved in this criminal enterprise. He kind of thought it was funny. Uh, but it wasn't funny to me, so I said, you got to stop this stuff. you got to shut this down. I called the cops. I let some people know, look, he made a mistake. It's being shut down. They raided the place, arrested Bob. And in those days, there weren't many people who were ever prosecuted and arrested for pandering. Lazar was. So, parole and probation. They're doing a background investigation, and they're going to make a recommendation to the court what the sentence should be for his crimes. He tells them the same story, where he went to school, where he worked, S4, MIT, Caltech, all that. And they investigated. They were having the same problems that I was having. They couldn't verify a lot of this stuff. If Bob truly was a UFO con man, that was the time to come clean. Because parole and probation was ticked off. They thought he was misleading them. And as a result of that, they were going to recommend, they did recommend that he do hard time, go to prison. He knew it. 
that was the time for him to come clean because it was a much better chance that he would not be sent to prison. He didn't. He stuck to his story. He told them the same story that he told me. That went a long way for me in showing that he had been telling the truth because it was definitely in his own self-interest to fess up at that point. And that's not what he did. He stuck to his guns. Here's the thing. Okay, I can see Bob Lazar pranks the UFO world and the UFO community. I can see him doing something like that. But does he lie to his mom and dad? Does he lie to his wife? Does he lie to all of his close friends and tell them the same story and try to get away with it? You look back on the people who knew him while this was going on, who knew him before he was hired to work out at S4, who knew him during the time he was going back and forth out there, and who stuck by him after this whirlwind of international publicity kind of rained down on his head. Everyone who knew him, everyone who was close to him, supports this story and says he's telling the truth. You saw something up there that you think might have been. I hate, I really hate to say stuff that I, I can't put my hands on and say this is absolutely for sure. Okay, uh, what did you say? I walked down the hallway at one time while I was working out there and um, there were doors, the doors that go to the hangars, the smaller doors from the corridors are, have a 9 inch or you know 12 inch square window with little wires running through it, just about head level. And I was, as I was walking by, I just glanced in and I noticed at a quick glance, there was there were two guys in white lab coats um, facing me towards the door, and they were looking down and talking to something small with with long arms. Now, I I was just surprised as I walked by, and I only caught a glance, but I don't know what on earth that was. People say you saw an alien. Did you see an alien at S four, Bob? I don't think I saw an alien at S four. You know we're splitting the hairs here. This had to do with a glance through a window that I wasn't supposed to be looking at anyway. And I'm still convinced. I looked in the window and I think these guys had a doll um, in a small chair, which was, you know, similar to what was in the craft. Um, and I think they were just looking at dimensions and they put something in there. And I just took it a glance and it was just you know, something tiny sitting in the chair. I, I don't think there was an alien there posing for him. You know, I think they just had a small character or something, and, you know, doing measurements or something. Again, we're talking about, you know, like a 400 millisecond glance. So now how much can you see out of that? I, don't, I never saw any aliens walking around there. I never heard anybody saying anything about living aliens. So I don't think that was it. But they did have a nickname for for the for the aliens. The I mean, kids. The kids. Is someone else here? Maybe visitors interested in us? In our genes? In our souls? Maybe we're property, just a goddamn commodity. We're like livestock. Maybe they'd like our condors and cupcakes, the kimono or the top hat, who the fuck knows. Or maybe every single sighting of things in the sky is a product of our collective consciousness. A false hope that humanity desperately needs intervention by external powers. We've always looked to the skies for answers instead of looking into ourselves. All right, so when, at what point, describe the evolution of your knowledge here. I mean, did you realize that this thing that you're working on came out of a flying saucer? Uh, well, of course, I know that technology doesn't exist at all. Why? Uh, well, it doesn't. Take my word for it. <laughs> it it's, uh, it's just technology that doesn't exist yet. I mean, you're talking about uh, that there is... Science doesn't even know what gravity is, much less how to produce it or control it. And here is a device that's producing it and controlling it and using it as uh, propulsion. So, You're telling me there's a different physics. That was your job. You were working on that. The science was something we were trying to figure out. But we knew how the devices would operate. You know, for instance, the propulsion of the craft. Everything that we have whether it's a propeller plane, 
or a jet or a rocket, it throws something out the back, either high-speed exhaust or a large volume of air. It's an action-reaction force. The action is you throw something out the back and it moves you forward. It's how everything works. This is the first time there's a craft that's it's a reactionless craft. It's a field propulsion craft. And what it does is it creates a distortion in space and time in front of it, where space actually bends. And my analogy to that has always been, put a bowling ball in the middle of your bed, and then a foot in front of it, take your fist and push down on the mattress. The bowling ball will roll towards it. And that's exactly how the craft works. It creates a distortion right in front of it, and the craft falls forward. There, so there's a different physics that we're not... Well, the science that explains how the technology works. I mean, it's all encompassed as one thing, alien technology and science. What is the big picture? What, are the, what is the takeaway of your story after you're gone? You're not a, a rebel kid with a, with a jet car at Los Alamos today. Today is a different Bob Lazar, right? Right. What have we learned? What's, what's the message of your story? What's... The big thing is the suppression of extremely advanced technology and the suppression of unknown science. That's it. Those two things, to me, is the only thing that's important about what was going on out there. Yeah, an there's another civilization, and like I've said before, that's a crime not to tell humanity about that, but that's a separate thing. Meaning that, that there is something different in science, dramatically, that we're not allowed to know? Right. Right. That is a true statement. Yeah, that's a true statement. The fact that there is another intelligent, technologically advanced civilization, we have some of their objects. That is really the pinnacle. That there is another civilization in existence that's intelligent that we know about. And we actually have artifacts from them that can operate. So, I mean, that's, that's a big, big deal. But in my mind, that's, there's a lot to deal with that. However, the science and the technology can change us dramatically. It can change the way the entire world operates, the economy, everything. So those stick out in my mind as being critically important. And we have it. No, oh, we have them. You don't have to believe it, but we do. And you've seen it. I've seen it. And you've touched it. I've dismantled it. After you're exposed to it, just for a little while, it begins to settle in your mind that these are normal things. Okay, 115 belongs there on the chart, and you know, these, this flies, and this is how gravity works. Great. Just like someone being <laughs> from the 1800s being exposed to a car for a few days, he takes it for granted very quickly. Um, the most shocking thing was when I actually got to look inside the disc, the seats in the panel associated with them were very small. They were, you know, perhaps that far off the ground, like something small. Now, you, if we had made something like that, we wouldn't have made it to fit children. It was, uh, it just led me to believe with the size of the alien cadavers I saw, the size of the seats inside. Memory is a mirage and mistress to desire. Shape-shifting and ethereal, she's inherently elusive and malleable. We acknowledge her if it suits our fantasy in the moment. We fear her because she is unpredictable. She's unpredictable. Can we trust our own memories? What if we can? What if we can? What if we can? Can we return to the scene of the crime to extract hidden details and to see more clearly what we thought we saw? I was told the rhythmic shouting and the constant threats, that's a form of hypnosis. Uh, when, did they, when did this happen? Oh, this happened almost immediately. They started yelling and screaming at you? Yeah. Oh, a fun place to work? 
Well, no, like I said, it was a, it was a terrible atmosphere to work in. But when you weigh that with what you're going to be around and, uh, you know, you basically go through anything. Yell at me, go ahead. When can we get back to the flying saucers? So, uh, you did hypnosis mm -hmm. to try to recall details from your employment and from the physics right. of what you learned. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct with Lane Keck. Okay. And did you recall anything? Yeah, I did. I mean, specifics, things you might might have missed. I basically wanted to try everything I could to prove what I was saying. So this is just another tool. You you were familiar that hypnosis can work. Yeah. To recall. Yeah, and I I had had it done to me before, so I had proven that yeah, this really does do something. Let's try and remember some fine details. Or you wanted to recall some physics that you learned there. Yeah, I wanted I wanted stuff. to recall as much as I possibly could. I mean, so much went through my mind. Just imagine all the things you were seeing, and every one is completely fascinating and something you haven't seen before. It's just data overload. So I was hoping that hypnosis would get me relaxed enough where maybe everything was packed so tight together. Maybe I could just start thumbing through things and just pick up even a couple little more tidbits could paint a bigger picture and I could, you know, possibly explain things better or, you know, possibly locate some of these other guys or anything, any of the information. So, yeah, and it was pretty handy. So you did recall some things te yeah. technically. Yeah, technical I things and probably others too. <laughs> More and more hypnosis is accepted. However, there's still a lot of uh, misconceptions about it. Like what? Oh, they think that uh, you go into a trance and uh, the hypnotist does something and you don't remember it and all of a sudden your life changes. And that's not the case at all. There's no mind control happening. Take, Take a, a nice, nice deep breath. breath. Close your eyes and just, and just think, think relaxation. relaxation. Now just think about your head and relax your head. Now what I want you to do is to get as comfortable as you possibly can. And just relax completely. Now double your relaxation and the number 100 will be there. One, zero, zero. Double your relaxation, and the number 99 will come right on in. Bob, Bob, from this moment on, from this moment on, you will recall and remember the material that you seek, and no one or nothing, past, past present, present, or future, or future will stand in your way. Bob. 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 You, you will, will remember, remember. Because you desire to remember. To remember. To remember. To remember. At one point, he was in hypnosis. I think it was drawing a reactor. He was trying to recall what was in the books. He saw it in the book, and then I told him, well, you'll come up and open your eyes, and you'll be able to draw. And uh, he did, but it didn't mean anything to him. But it was a drawing that he drew this way. Oh, but, no way. But it was this way. And so afterwards, he looked at it, and he you know, came back over and sat down here for a while, and oh, that's because all he had to do is turn it. So that's the super conscious and literal. The subconscious takes things literal. Right, like it's like the mind is absorbing all this stuff, and then he discovers what his mind had absorbed. He's remembering. Yeah. I was writing so fast. I can't imagine what you were thinking, too, because you're discovering with them that kind of shock. What's the truth? Hypnosis is the best.
possible tool of getting to the truth. If a person makes things up normally, they can lie under hypnosis just as easily as out of hypnosis. But if they're really trying to get to and retrieve information, then it's the best tool that I know of. He came in to find out what he didn't know. We were able to go back, overcome the fear, and bring forth those memories. According to Lazar, his employer was the United States Navy. He says he and other government employees would gather near EG&G, fly to Groom Lake, and then a very few people would get into a bus with blacked out or no windows and drive to S4. When you get off the bus, what do you see? Very interesting building. It's got a slope of probably about 30 degrees, the, uh, which are hangar doors. And it has textured paint on it, but it's, it looks like sand. It's made to look like the side of the mountain that it's in, whether it's to disguise it from satellite photographs or what. He says he was never told exactly what he'd be working on, but figured it had something to do with advanced propulsion. On his first day, he was told to read a series of briefings and immediately realized how advanced the propulsion was. The power source is an antimatter reactor. Uh, they run gravity amplifiers. There's actually two parts to the drive mechanism. Uh, it's just, it's a bizarre technology. There's no physical hookup between any of the systems in there. Uh, they use gravity as a wave using waveguides, almost like microwaves. Polygrapher Terry Tavernetti runs a corporate security operation and is a former Los Angeles police officer. He put Lazard through four tests and concluded there was no attempt to deceive. And I left there thinking that uh, I feel we do have some credibility uh, to what uh, the subject had to say. Uh, and that's when I went to some of my colleagues. Tavernetti sent the test results to a third polygrapher who agreed the results appeared truthful. Bob has explained to me multiple times he tried everything in his power to prove his story. I wanted to feel better for myself. So I said, hey, would you be willing to undergo a polygraph test? He did not hesitate. He said, yes. Four different tests on four different areas of Bob's uh, claims. And he said afterward, there is no attempt to deceive at all. He's telling what he believes to be the truth. I have asked the question many times over the years, how did Bob Lazar know this stuff if he wasn't there? He knew there was a place called S4. I had called Nellis Air Force Base Public Information Office. They confirmed for me there really was a place called S4. Now, there's no news story prior to Bob Lazar uh, about any place called S4. He knew about it. He also knew that EG&G had arranged to hire personnel, that if you were going to get it, get a job out of Groom Lake, eg and was the company that you would go through. He knew that there had been uh, investigators at his home for the background check. You remember the guy's name. It was an odd name, Mike Thigpen. Now, how did he know? How did he know that Mike Thigpen works for a federal agency that does this stuff? After 30 years and, and this guy dodging you, I found Mike Thigpen. I found Thigpen. That's amazing. I couldn't believe it. it he's, he's on the East Coast. I called him, I've talked with him multiple times, you know, he won't go on camera because he doesn't want to kind of put a dark shadow upon the work that he did before, but personally, he conveyed to me that that was his job, that was exactly what he did in Las Vegas in 1989, and in fact, he remembers Bob Lazar. The most important thing Bob knew is that they were flying something that looks exactly like a flying saucer over Papoose Lake, and they flew him on Wednesday nights. And he took people out there three weeks in a row and showed it to them. And uh, at least once, maybe twice, they recorded it on video. That's real. How did Bob know that? There have been no stories about test flights and flying saucers at Papoose Lake. And by the way, that's where it was. It wasn't over a Groom Lake. It was over Papoose Lake. We checked out so many details that Bob had told us that turned out to be true. The existence of S4, Element 115 really did become an element years later that Bob had been consulted by the, the lab which first synthesized man-made element 115. There was a whole long string of things that he knew that checked out. These milestones along the way, no matter how much we nitpick it apart, no matter how much people don't want to believe it, the evidence that he's telling the truth outweighs the evidence that he's not. Well, I agree with you. And if I did not believe that, I would not still be working on the story. I would not be publicly defending Bob Lazar.
what was your function of working on this? You were doing what? What was your job? We were to reverse engineer the power and propulsion system of this craft and see if it can be duplicated with available materials. I just want to go over with you what it is that you saw to draw it out for people, to make a sketch. As you're seeing it, as if you're there at that moment, kind of go back in the past. It's the thing I termed the sport model. Underneath this floor, there are three, three large centrical devices. These are on mounts that allow them to completely swivel up to 180 degrees and in 360 degree rotation. Directly above each one is a small rectangular object. This is on the floor above. And these are the gravity amplifiers themselves. Looking down from the top, you'd have the center. In the very center, there is a small reactor. Surrounding this in three equally spaced areas are the amplifiers. So this is looking at it sideways. This is looking at it down from the top. And under these amplifiers, underneath, on the floor below, are the gravity emitters. So it's the reactor here powering the gravity amplifiers. Gravity amplifiers output goes into the gravity emitters at the bottom and the resulting gravity beam or anti-gravity wave can be pretty much put anywhere you want to. Um, there was another level up here. Now I had access and was permitted to view and look at the operation of this main level with the gravity amplifiers and the level below uh, the gravity emitters. There is a level above which consisted of these two areas that I'm not all that familiar with. I assume these to be some sort of navigational engine. Uh, people call these large black rectangular areas on the top portholes. I believe they were some planar sensor array that just took in information from the surrounding area, whether it be patterns of stars or what have you. Uh, and there was their version of a computer or something to make determinations here that takes input from those sensors and then let the craft know how to orient itself and where it was in space. So that's what I assumed to be up there. I don't know for a fact. Again, that was not part of my job and I was only led to believe that. The center antenna is really an extension of the reactor in the center. And that's a waveguide, which allows the, uh, the emission of the gravity wave, which forms kind of a heart shape over the whole, the whole craft. That's how it creates its distortion. These uh, gravity emitters can be swung all the way up to 180 degrees. And this allows the craft to essentially stand on two of them and hover while this one swings up and creates a distortion in front of it, allowing the craft to slide forward. So that's how their low power mode, uh, Omicron configuration operate. The Delta configuration uses all three. And unlike science fiction movies where you see flying saucers just flying along like that, they actually fly belly first. The craft flies along, leaves the atmosphere of the planet, it turns its belly to the destination. The three amplifiers focus in on the destination, and that's how it proceeds. So that's basically the operation of it and overall how things were laid out inside the craft. This is an alien spacecraft. Right, right, obviously.
This was uh, the Albuquerque, Albuquerque Journal. Journal. Is that your particle accelerator you had? Yeah. The guy that promised not to say anything. I won't say anything about the UFOs. The article is titled The UFO Guy in Spotlight. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Isn't that when, after this came in there, is in the fire department, police, the zoning commission, everybody descended on our yeah, house? Yeah, I wanted to know. Here's lab supplier and controversy. Oh, look at that. So originally, the, the thing was supposed to be about what? What did the guy say the article was? The hydrogen was? car, I think. It well, was. the it was raid. The it was about the raid. This yeah, one? that's why lab supplier and controversy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. The raid in New Mexico. And the guy called, you know, he said, hey, I heard about the raid and all that. Can I right. come and, you know, do that? And then he says, are you Bob Lazar, the guy, Area 51 guy? I said, yeah, but I don't want to get into that. This is something more important. He said, oh, yeah, we don't even mention it. No problem. Literally, your house was taken over by a SWAT team? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Don't just send a letter in the mail or call us. <laughs> right. Have the whole... SWAT team and invite themselves to our home. Hidden things are the most seductive. So secrets reach deep into our desire. They titillate and torment us like a ticking clock or a distant alarm with no origin. They agitate us and force us to react. They endanger our complacency. There is a missing element to your faith. But that's the nature of faith, that there is something out there that offers the promise of salvation. salvation. Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. At the tone, please record your message. Hey, Jeremy, it's Bob Lazar. Listen, I have something to ask you, something's really come up that's important. If you would text me, and let me know when is a good time to call you. I don't want you to call me. I just need to run something by you. Okay, thanks, bye. All right, so the only record of this is going to be on the audio on this one file, and then this video clip. I'm not gonna cut it, I'm gonna let it run. Understood. Okay, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna encrypt it, and I'm gonna put both of those two files into an encrypted thing to not be touched unless we decide it should be touched. That's yeah, fine. Okay, it'll be on two drives, but that those two files will both be in an encrypted folder. So here's the deal. Did you ever get a piece of Element 115 out of Los Alamos? I don't know how much monitoring they do with me. I'm sure it's virtually none after all this time. Hold on, the one same second. Thing. Hold on one second. Let me. Um, do you have your phone on you? Yes. Um, let's at this point uh, take our phone. Let me just throw them. Let me put them in the ground over there. I'll turn mine off. I mean, maybe this has been kept from us for a good reason. A lot of people agreed to keep this secret. So, first of all, who am I to upset it? And second of all, who am I to outthink these guys? Maybe they went over all these scenarios already and they know how fucked up everything will be. So, there's no guarantee that this revelation is going to make everything great. It could, there's just as much chance it's going to make everything terrible, and I'll be to blame for that. They identified themselves as FBI, and um, they uh, said, you're Bob Lazar, right? And then, you know, one of them got on the radio saying, yeah, he's here. Apparently, they also had my house staked out, and they were deciding whether or not to go there. The conveyor belt of vehicles and agents and police did not stop. The whole thing it was like a Twilight Zone episode. They came in and then they said, there'll be a few other people coming here. Just got a couple questions to ask you. In a short time, the street filled up with vehicles and the building completely filled with agents. It was really something else. Did they identify themselves initially as Yeah, FBI? it was FBI identified themselves, then came in 
state police and a few other agencies. I don't remember who, but um, there were a lot, an awful lot. Standing room only in, in the building. It was it was crazy. Yeah, they had like a forensic truck. They had a bunch of different agents. They gridded off the building. I mean, obviously they're they're looking for something. Yeah. Yeah, and what they said, they were looking for some paperwork, an old order from two years ago about a customer that, uh, you know, ordered some potentially toxic material, which <laughs> they could have called for, but uh, this was certainly way over the top. I looked up to select the right key, and they were right beside me. It was quite surprising, considering you could see all around here and there would generally have to be a vehicle or something somewhere. But I just pulled up, got out, picked the key, and then they started talking from behind me. I thought that was really strange. Of course, it got much stranger as the day went on. What, what got stranger about it? Well, just the sheer amount of people that came. Agency after agency. And, I mean, they had computer experts here going through, you know, all the computer equipment we had here. They had people sectioning off the building, labeling it in cubic meters so they can search each one. You know, what they were looking for was just a, an order form. So, very strange. You've been raided two times? Twice. By more agencies than I can really recall. The FDA, to the NRC, the FBI, but they, they usually come in, in mass and it's hard to pick out who's who. So this is beryllium? Yeah. And what is it used for again? It's used in aerospace. It's very lightweight. Quite strong and high temperature metal. Do you think that you you were shaken down to some degree you're being fucked with? I don't think they're just fucking with me. I'm convinced there's ulterior motives. I firmly suspect that there's a, a lot more to it than they're saying. That they're looking for something else. What they're supposed to do is tie you up put you in the middle of the room, have everyone watching you so that you can't, you know, collaborate a story or, you know, try to trick them or whatnot. So they just kept kept us all in separate rooms. There's bomb squad, uh, computer squad, I think they have like a biological hazard squad, hazmat squad, everything made the full gamut because they had no idea um, what we had in our shop or like what we're capable of or are we going to retaliate or anything like that. So it was pretty much like the full Michigan FBI was here. I mean, they had the van, they had multiple cars lined up, you know, so. I mean, in looking at Bob's life, there, there's always this suspicion that there's something more going on on shaking him down because yeah. he, had, he had that experience before. Yeah, so this is the second time that I know of that he's gotten raided. So he's always had like this kind of knowledge that there's somebody watching no matter what he does there's always somebody watching you and it does have to be related to the area 51 stuff and all that you know to kind of put him on a list i think they do like toying with him and keeping an eye on him but i don't believe that it's like they're opening up a 30 year old file and they're like all right we're going to crack down on the bob story we're going to find out if he had what he has what information he's got i don't think that they're necessarily doing that but i do think that there's like a culture maybe within these agencies of they know who this guy is and they'll have you know, they'll look for any reason that they can to kind of, you know, poke him with some thorns and make sure that he knows, you know, who's watching him. I, I believe that. It's too coincidental for it all to be just, you know, you know, just some luck of the draw, basically. Like, there's, there's something going on. Everybody knows the story is that you got some Element 115 out of Los Alamos. That, that's public knowledge. Something you said a while back. Do you think that what happened had to do with, with that? We're not going there. Are they trying 
to shake you down to find the 115 that you said 30 years ago that you got out of the lab. People are going to ask that. Yeah. So let's just address that. If you feel comfortable addressing it. No. Do you not feel comfortable addressing that? No, I don't feel comfortable addressing that. You would think after 30 years, who cares what I have to say? I, I'm more convinced than ever that the key to the story is element 115. If you could get to that piece and have it independently analyzed, I think it would prove beyond all question that it came from somewhere else. We didn't make it. And it would go a long way toward establishing the story that was told by Bob Lazar as truth. So, so I think about that a lot. I think about the cloud chamber experiment. I get a lot of emails from people who say, oh God, where's this video? You owe it to the world to show this video, cough it up. And I tell them, look, I've looked for it. I've got all these boxes of crap and stuff and tape and news clippings, and I've looked for it and I can't find it. But when somebody like you comes and talks to me about uh, the Bob Lazard story, it gets the juices flowing in. You know, I can't help it. I'm human. And, uh, and, and right now, I want to go find that tape. I went through every tape that Bob had in his personal home archive and one of those tapes on the outside in tiny, tiny little scribble said cloud chamber. And lo and behold, there's about just less than a minute of that cloud chamber test on tape. I have it. People have been so pissed at me over the years that I can't find that tape or they think I'm hiding it on purpose, but I've looked everywhere for it. And uh, if you found it, that's awesome. I did, now here's the deal, in, in typical, you know, Bob Lazar fashion, there's only about a minute of it. However, and after all these years, 30 years, we have some footage of it, but it doesn't prove shit because um, it's recorded. Uh, I was there the night that they, they did the cloud chamber test. I couldn't tell you what it was. I didn't know what a cloud chamber was. This beam of light was bent, and it was bent because they had a little bit 115 in, in as part of the experiment. I said, well, that's pretty important. That would be huge to include in the story. I spent time trying to understand why everybody was saying this 115 being stabilized is pseudoscience. So I called some of the top heavy element physicists on the planet from, from Russia to up in San Francisco to Washington DC. And I spoke with, you know, about eight or nine, but three in particular who would really talk to me in depth about it, all of them across the board said, you cannot rule out a stabilized version of element 115. In fact, that we believe it is theorized that it in the island of stability that it would and could and probably does exist. We, so their way of saying it is we can't rule it out. So all these people saying that is pseudoscience, what Bob said about element 115, I wanted to find out, is it pseudoscience? And definitively, we cannot rule out a stabilized form of element 115. I'm sorry, it is not pseudoscience. And after doing this research, you know, that, that argument no longer holds water. It makes perfect sense that it could be stable, and scientists have said it for a long time. So of course you can't rule it out. Again, if you want to disbelieve Bob, if you run to cross him off the list and say he's a fraud, then you your research goes one inch deep, and you say element 115, as he described it, can't exist, and then move on. If you want to be honest about it and, and dig further into it and understand it, then you're going to find out that, in fact, what Bob says does make sense. It can be true. Element 115 was what we would call the fuel, what provided the power for the reactor to work. What happens with gravity and 115? Element 115 affects gravity. Element 115 produces its own gravitational energy. It had a very specific manufacturing technique. I don't really know how that information came to be. Um, its code name was LA-1000. That's what it was referred to off-site. Its purpose was supposed to be, again, this is just 
the code and deception, was supposed to be an advanced armor. So it's an unusual material, so now we can take it to a national lab. This is LA-1000 classified material. It's a very advanced armor that takes care of all weird questions. So, you know, you immediately start operating on lies. This fuel is in the form of a just a three-dimensional thin triangle, little rounded edges. It's somewhat copper in color, you know, that reddish brownish. The way this is manufactured is really critical. It's not just cut out of a heavy sheet of material. A cylinder of this material is taken. This is machined into a cone. So this is the outer part is shaved off using a lathe or something like that until you have a three-dimensional cone. Once you have the cone, it's sliced like this. And these slices become that. Now even this starting piece a solid cylinder is not even a solid cylinder. It consists of many discs stacked up. And these are fused together to produce that. And all of these steps are necessary to produce a successful triangle that brings fuel. So actually, you know, if you were to look at how this came to be, this would actually be pieces of all these discs that were cut at unusual angles. Now apparently if you don't do all this, that doesn't work. So unfortunately that's the extent of my knowledge on this. This makes no sense anywhere, but that's what it takes for it to operate. Now with the alien technology that was present in the craft, it takes that basis, that extra gravitational energy in a small reactor, amplifies it through the equipment there, directs it through the waveguides and archways into the emitters, and allows it to propel the craft and manipulate the gravity wave for whatever use they want. How can this be true? I don't believe a word of this. Uh, do you expect people to believe it? No, I'm not going to change anyone's mind. That's not my intention. I'm just, I'm just relaying the experience, the job that I went through. Uh, it is a fantastic thing. It's a fantastic story. But it's true. It's true. These crafts came from another, not, not just another planet, another solar system entirely, extremely far away. And they're here. I mean, I've been making fireworks since I was 12, and professional fireworks for at least 20 years. Fireworks are just fun, they're artistic. It's like painting the sky. Controlling a large amount of energy has always been impressive. Since the New York Times story broke, since Lou Elizondo came forward and said those videos went public, the world is now talking about UFOs in a more serious vein. I think that's a good thing, and I think it reflects positively on Bob Lazar's story, and I hope that the world will take another look at it. Thus, the, the jet bike, the jet car. Yeah, to take, you know, a large amount of energy, which would normally be thought to be out of control, to take that and harness it and have it do what you want has always been impressive to me. The easy way out is to say he's a liar, he's making it up. It's hard to go ahead and accept the possibility that he's telling the truth. But if I did not believe it, if uh, I thought for a moment that he was lying about it, I'd be done with it. I wouldn't still be supporting it 30 years later. Your life has been under a microscope. Every word you said for 30 years recorded has been under a microscope. And that's, that's affected you. Yeah, of course it has. It affected anybody. How, how has it affected you? 
in the way I talk and how much I do. I'd rather not, you know, in a public forum, I'd rather just not say anything. Why do you think people are so obsessed with every word that you say about your experiences, you know, working They're at They're just looking for a way to, uh, to look for an inaccuracy and, and to be able to discount the whole thing. Oh, he said this one time and said it's slightly different this time. You know, obviously he's making it up. No, that's just the first word that entered my mind. You know, I don't put that much thought into it when I'm saying it. Look, as, as much as a lot of people hate it, this stuff really happened. I mean, if it bothers you, that's too bad. I, I think that's just hard for people to accept. I mean, so... Yeah, it would be... Look, I fully understand. I would feel the same way. I'm not sure I would believe my story. Boy, there's not enough evidence, you know, but uh, I couldn't discount it either. The fact is, the people that know him best believe him the most. I hope that one thing that comes across in your film is the real Bob. Once you get to know him, it becomes much more plausible as a story. He's not lying to his mom and his wife and all his friends. He's not lying to the UFO world either. You saw alien ships. Yeah. You worked on a gravity wave amplification system trying to figure it out. Right, a propulsion system and a power source that's completely unknown to mankind. And there's no way human beings could have made it. There is no way human beings could have made it under any circumstances in any country, anywhere, period. And, and for 30 years, you, you are telling us the truth. You bet. This shit happened. You got it. You know, the, the fact is that that raid that happened in Michigan, that's a very dramatic and very important development. They weren't there looking for records about some uh, customer he had a couple of years ago. They were looking for 115. When you bring two dozen agents and investigators and a crime lab analysis, and you can bring people to duplicate the whole computers and all that stuff, they're looking for something else. Sure as hell are not looking for a, a minor receipt. Uh, people may not believe that 115 is real, but somebody does, because that's what they came to look for. You know, if you want to you want to cross it off and you don't want to believe it, fine. I don't care anymore whether people believe it or not. But Bob's telling the truth. And once you realize that, it changes everything for you. It changed everything for me. To crack a life open, and it seems, to dissect and examine its content is unnerving. Like the reading of omens by viewing the entrails. We all tell our own stories. Sometimes we even believe them. And sometimes we tell them one last time. time. If you don't believe it, that's your problem. That's your problem. What you do with that is up to you. Well, I am telling the truth. I, I, I've tried to prove that uh, what's going on up there could be the most important event in history. You're talking about contact, physical, <laughs> physical contact and proof of, from another, another system, another planet, another intelligence. That's got to be the biggest event in history, period. And it's real. And it's real and it's there. And uh, I had a, an extremely small part in it, but I'm convinced that what I saw is absolute proof of that. There is, there is no way we could have created those systems. There's no way we could have made the disks, the power supplies, anything to go with them. Lazar says he has no intention of going on any UFO lecture circuit. He's not looking to do any additional interviews. In fact, he wasn't too crazy about doing this one. He did it after certain unfavorable things started happening in his life, and he did it because he feels that whoever is running the show up at S4 is perpetrating a fraud on the American people and on the scientific community. We intend to have much more about this story, about the operation up there on Monday and beyond. This is by no means the end of this series of reports. In fact, on Monday, including in our story there, support testimony from other people who say they have knowledge of the flying disks at the test site and information from people who know Lazar very well and insist his story is true. If indeed they have these flying saucers, George, it seems like it'd be really hard to keep it so secret. Well, uh, yeah, it would, it would seem that way, except for as Lazar asked his uh, superiors up there, they say it's the easiest secret in the world to keep. It's leaked out many times before and nobody believes it. 
But what's the Navy saying about all of this? Well, of course, the Navy is supposed to have been his, his employer, and we have put some fairly pointed questions, questions to them. Of course, number one, it may not be the Navy at all. Information is so compartmentalized up there, no one is exactly sure who is in charge. We have uh, put the questions to several Navy departments. The answers thus far have been unsatisfactory. We've applied for more information through the Freedom of Information Act, and that information uh, will be revealed on Monday as well. You believe his story, don't you? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I've, I've got to know him uh, pretty well over the last couple of months, and uh, I believe he's telling the truth. Fascinating stuff. Thank Thanks, you, George. George.